Well, Father, we are here again at this particular time in our worship service, Lord, as we prepare to hear from your word. And we thank you for the opportunity and the privilege. And we are asking again that God, the Holy Spirit, would have his way in all of our hearts and minds. I come alongside all of us, Father, and ask that we would get a specific word um, for our lives from you. That, Father, you would speak to us through this passage, whether it be directly, Lord, from the text or a side comment or scriptures that we might use in addition to the text. And so, Father, we are just trusting you to really minister to all of us in these areas, Father, about being disqualified in Christian service, perhaps temptation or testing or trials going on in our lives, maybe some things that we assume um, we'll be talking about today. We just trust you, Father, that you would really use the topics for your glory and honor, and that truly when we leave here today, we don't leave the same, that we receive something from you. We're challenged, Father, and um, we come to a crisis where we have to deal with what we've heard today. And so, Father, we pray that you'll bring us to that place and then we pray, Lord, and thank you. Your grace is available for us to then respond properly as you would have us to respond to your spirit. So grant us to choose. Grant us to allow him to have his way. We ask, Lord, that we would all be filled with your spirit at this time, Lord, so that we can learn, so that we can be enabled, empowered, that he can have his way and do just what he wants to do, um, spreading God's fame, spreading Christ's fame as well. So thank you for everything. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. As I already mentioned, our verse for today, our focus verse is basically 1 Corinthians 10, 13. And so our context as a whole is the book of 1 Corinthians specifically, okay? So we're talking about our context being the book of 1 Corinthians and specifically the first 10 chapters. As we get into 1 Corinthians 10, 13, there's a closer context. We call it moving from the general to the specific. And so in our moving from the general to the specific context, our context begins at chapter 9, verse 24, establishing our tighter context. This particular portion of scripture here is tied to 1 Corinthians 10, 13. So this is kind of bringing us from a general context to a specific context. I begin 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. Therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air, but I discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. Again, I mentioned it. We're going to establish our context. Can you give me an amen? amen. All right. We're going to establish our context. And so bear with me because this is important. We're talking about the letter of 1 Corinthians as a whole. And on Wednesday night, we're up in Acts chapter 16 and we're studying the second missionary journey of the Apostle Paul. Paul and company shared the gospel in a place called Corinth during this second missionary journey. So he was there in Corinth for about 18 months. After leaving the area, if you allow me this term, he heard some things about this particular church through the grapevine. OK, he heard some things through the grapevine about this particular church. And at the same time, this particular church wrote Paul a letter. We have some questions. You were here 18 months, but we have some questions we need you to answer. And so they sent Paul a letter. At the same time, as I said, he had been hearing things about the church. So when we get into 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians is a letter that Paul wrote to, first of all, address the things he was hearing through the grapevine and then to answer the questions that the Corinthians had sent him in a letter. So there's our general context about the book. As I just had you read or we just read some scriptures in chapter nine, we want to give you a little tighter context as we talk about chapter nine and work our way up to um, chapter 10, verse 13. The first nine chapters of first Corinthians address some specific topics. There were divisions in this church and Paul starts to address those divisions. There was immorality in this church. Paul addresses the immorality in the first nine um, chapters. They had some questions about marriage. He uses chapter seven to teach them some things about marriage. 
And then there was a very relevant issue at their time, meat or food offered to idols and going to restaurants or people's homes and eating that particular food. And so that was a very relevant issue, and he addresses that in the first nine chapters as well. As we read chapter 9, he starts to address something even more specific. This is personal rights and restrictions. Personal rights and restrictions. He shares that, you know, he has the privilege, and it's even the right thing to do certain things at certain times or to not do certain things at certain times. But God calls us as Christians, he calls the Corinthians, he called Paul, to sometimes give up your right to be right. OK, you have a right to do something. You have a right to be something. But there are times when God, the Holy Spirit will say, don't do that right now. Don't take that right. Don't hold on to that. Let that go right now. And so he starts addressing um, this thing of rights and restrictions. Paul says, I have a right to get paid, but I forego that. Paul says, I'm an apostle. There are certain things that I can have. And one of them, Paul said, was I can have a wife like the rest of these apostles who have wives. We have a right to that, too. Then he says something real serious. Is it just me and Barnabas who don't get paid for ministry? And so he starts talking about, I have a right to these things, but I've given up my right to these things because I don't want anything to ever hinder the gospel. I don't want anybody to ever call me out on anything that they can't hear what I'm saying because of some right I'm holding on to. So he says Christians have to learn about their rights and their restrictions and do them filled by the spirit. Very, very important. So he goes on to share. You got to know when to give up your rights. You got to know when to give up your privileges so that you can do things that help the gospel go further. So those are some of the things that he talks about. And then Paul, we just read it, he does something that may be kind of mind-blowing. He says, I discipline myself. I beat myself black and blue. Why? Because I don't ever want to get disqualified from ministry. I don't ever want to get disqualified from service. So Paul had some truth that maybe the Corinthians didn't have and maybe some of us don't have. He's bringing it to the attention of the readers that, you know, you can be disqualified from serving God. You can be disqualified. And so he said, I can be disqualified. So I train hard so that I don't get disqualified. And so those are some of the things that he's addressing. And so as we continue to work our way up to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, um, he starts to take them back down memory lane. And he says, you remember Israel? Remember Israel in the past? And so he starts talking about Israel. Israel was God's chosen people. God chose them and they were to live in such a way that they glorified God. Israel was to live in such a, such a way as a nation. They would spread God's fame. They would spread God's name. OK, they would highlight God. That's how Israel was supposed to live. As we get into the context, that is their service or their ministry to God. OK, amen. Still with me? Stay with me now. Stay with me. And so there to show the world what God's like. Israel's supposed to show the world what God is like. This is how they serve God. So show the world what I'm like. They were to introduce other people to God. Some evangelism there. Introduce them to me. That was what their service was. That is what their ministry was. They were to show others, if you allow this term, life God's way. They were to show others and teach others about God, beginning with his name. His name is Yahweh. And so they were supposed to be serving God in that way. As they came through Egypt and saw all that they saw, they saw God's power. God parted the Red Sea. They saw God's power. They saw God's miracles. They saw God's favor. They saw God be faithful to supply for them. They saw all of these things. And so these are God's people in ministry seeing all of these things. The bottom line is they experienced God. They experienced what God could do. They saw what God could do. They had great potential to serve God. They had great potential. But Paul says in 1 Corinthians, but you know what? In the end, God was not pleased with most of them. In the end, God was not pleased with them. And here's where it gets uh, interesting. In the end, most of them were disqualified from service. Most of them were disqualified from service. Did you remember that most of them didn't go to the 
promised land, they didn't make it. And even Moses and Aaron didn't make it either. Okay? And so we talk about them and stay with us. You, we're going to go back down in history. So as he's talking to the Corinthians, here's something else he does as he works his way up to 1 Corinthians 10, 13. He says, I want you to remember that those things that happened to them are written here so we would remember and not do what they did. Not do what they did. And so why did they get disqualified? What disqualified them? You need a word from God today. And I'm sure hoping you get one. But here's probably a place where you might want to get a pencil and check and say, hmm, is this something that I need to look in the mirror and check in my own life? So what disqualified the nation of Israel from service? Well, chapter 10, verse 6 says, number one, they craved evil things. They craved evil things. Time and time again, it's time to do what's right. They want to do what's evil. They craved evil things. Then we get into chapter 10, verse 7. They became idolaters. They became idolaters. And you'll have to bear with me here because we have an American view of idolatry, and it's a good one. It works. Americans view, and it's a good view. It, it works okay, is that an, an idol is anything that I love more than God. OK, that works. That's an idol. Amen. But you have to understand that in the particular time in which we were dealing, when people thought of idols, especially Israel, what they thought of was that you were worshiping the God that was tied to the idol that you're connected with that there was a power behind the idol. It wasn't just a rock or a stone or a new car. It was the power behind the idol that was real. And so for an Israelite, idolatry was playing around with another god. When they were worshiping the golden calf, it was not just worshiping the golden calf alone. They were saying, bring the golden calf and put him alongside of, beside of Yahweh. We'll do both. We'll do a little bit of both. OK, so as we're talking about our lives and life application, do we crave evil things like they did? This is what he's saying. This is what happened to them. And then they were idolatrous. Are you and I guilty of bringing a little something else and putting it with God and calling it, quote, religion? Or are we worshiping other things or other people more than we do God? So then Israel, what what disqualified them, Paul? They acted immorally. They acted immorally. Our culture is just like rewarding immorality right now. I don't know if you understand what's going on. Things are so twisted. Our heads are literally on backwards and nothing is immoral anymore at all. Everything is a choice and something that I have going on in my life, but nothing is a sin. Immorality. It's all over the place. It's even in the church. Sin and it's being justified. Amen? Immorality. They were disqualified because of immorality. And oh, man, here's one. Chapter 10, verse nine. The Bible says, Paul said, Corinthians, wake up. Did you know Israel was disqualified because they were always trying the Lord? When God said something, not believing him, going over it over and over and over again, not believing him, not receiving what he's saying, not acting like God is God, but that God is like a man like me and I can do whatever I want in my attitudes toward him. Trying God, they were disqualified. And oh, here's one that's really easy. Keep it in the context. He says, you know what? Be careful. Israel was disqualified from service because they're constantly grumbling and complaining. Amen? amen? Stay with me. Stay with me now. Keep them amens coming. I'm getting it just like you are. I got it before you did. You know that. You know I say that all the time. So in 1 Corinthians, we're working our way to um, verse 13. We get into verse 12, okay? And basically what, what verse 12 says is, I'm just going to read it to you now. It says, Therefore, let him who thinks he stand take heed lest he does not fall. The tight context before we get to the verse we're looking at, Paul is basically telling the Corinthians, hey, pay attention. Corinthians, don't get lulled to sleep. 
Deal in reality here, okay? Because if we're not careful, we start to kind of get all fuzzied up and we're not really dealing in reality about where we are, where we're going, and what's really going on in our lives. He says, be very careful. What he's saying in this verse is, don't think that that won't or can't happen to you. Amen? Amen. Don't think that that can't happen to you, won't happen to you. I say it this way, don't ever say what you won't do. I'm consistent. You've been hearing it for years, right? I don't say that. I don't say that at all because I don't know. Some of the stuff comes out of me sometimes surprises me. I'm talking about the bad stuff. Hey, man, I'm not going to tell you what I won't do, you know, or what I would do. I hope I would do the right thing. I say H-O-P-E. I hope I would. So he's telling them, you know, those of you that think you stand, take heed lest you fall. Christians, somebody here today can be sitting here that really thinks that no matter what, you're going to always do the right thing and you're going to be there says, take heed. You might fall sometime. You have the ability. And here's how. He says, you know what? Take heed. Don't forget the context. You might be capable, if you're not paying attention, to start craving evil things. You might fall into idolatry. You might fall into immorality. You might be guilty of trying God. You might be, shucks, be guilty of grumbling and complaining. You. Nobody here does that, right? Nobody. If we're not careful, we could end up doing any of these. But he's saying, don't tell yourself, no way, I'm good. It's all good. That won't happen to me. Amen. That's what he's telling them. OK. And so he says, before we go any further, let me give you a little schooling, because you know what? Some things are going to come into your life. You lived long enough to know some things are going to come into your life. Amen. What is it? What is Miss Anna's famous quote? Just keep living. Amen. A couple of us were down in the bathroom downstairs in there, you know, going and seeing what we need to do, tidy up whatever we need to do in the bathroom. And what we're talking about, the aches and pains that we have, the aches and pains. I'm like, yeah, I said, this is me. I can't tell you who the other brother was or his business, but I can tell you mine. I'm in there saying, you know, my leg is hurting. My hip is hurting. My knee is hurting. I said, I thought I was Superman. I wasn't going to be going through all this stuff. I'm going through it now. You know what I'm saying? And so we all have lived long enough to know you're going to go through some things. And you are going to go through some trials. Some of us are going through some unbelievable trials right now. You might be able to say amen because you're going through that trial. You're going through something that's just unbelievable. How can you go through that? You're going through it. I was talking to a man in the office this week that was telling me some of the temptations he was going through. I was just like, how in the world did you get through that? I just I wouldn't have made it. He did the right thing. The temptation came, did the right thing. I'm like, how did you do that? Now I'm just listening. How did you do that? Some folks are sitting here right now going through some serious temptations. Amen. Serious trials and testings. So we really. Understand, just keep living. You're going to go through something. You're going to go through something. And if you got a break right now, enjoy it. Enjoy it. You're going to get a turn. We're all going to get a turn here, okay? All right. So we have worked our way up there. We're in chapter 10, verse 12. It's like, okay, watch yourself. This could happen to you. So now our text for the day. Now, I did something a little bit different. So you're going to need your bulletin. OK, you're going to need your bulletin. You got a bulletin. Everybody got a bulletin. And so we are going to go into this one verse. But what I did is I put it in your bulletin in three different versions. And so we are going to read this together and um, we're going to read this in the New American Standard. We're going to read it in the English Standard Version and then we're going to read it in the New King James. OK, I'm going to preach it out of the NASB. So one more time, if you don't mind, I'd like for you to stand again. It's OK. They say change it every eight minutes. People get bored if you don't have them doing the same thing for every eight minutes. I get I get I get schooled on this all the time. There's a there's a guy in our church that keeps me updated on how often you need to be getting up, moving around and I need to be acting a fool every eight minutes. OK, every eight minutes at least. All right. So we're going to read this together. OK, out loud together. And um, we're going to jump into it. So we're going to start it out. I might I may jump in. I may jump out a little bit, but you just keep reading. Same verse three times. Pay attention. OK, 
No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man, and God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that ye may be able to bear it. Amen. You may have a seat. Okay, verse 12, take heed, take heed. Those of you who think you stand so you don't fall, be careful. Don't get disqualified from service. Paul is saying it can happen to you. We would say it this way in 2019, don't be overconfident. Don't be overconfident in your service to God, okay? So we begin here and we open this up, verse 13, with a statement of fact. A statement of fact, it says, no temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. OK, that's our very first statement of fact. Nothing has come into your life, folks, that hasn't come into the lives of someone else. OK, and it's talking about humankind there. Is it talking about man? It's talking about humankind. So we get into this. He's making this statement. Remember, take heed. He's tying it back to that. So he's saying when something comes into your life, don't be acting like you're the only one this has ever happened to. Can I get an amen? amen. Don't, don't come in here if you only knew. Don't go back and sing that old song. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Nobody knows but Jesus. Okay, it sounds good, but it ain't biblical. Okay, no, somebody else knows the trouble you've seen. Somebody else besides Jesus. And stay with me now, stay with me. And somebody's been through more trouble than you've seen. OK. And so he says, make sure you get that going, because you know what? Some of us get into pity parties and we are very susceptible to get disqualified from service. Are you following me? Because we do something from our pity that we shouldn't do. OK. And you've heard this before. And some of our spiritual gifts, like let's say you have the gift of mercy. The people with the gift of mercy have something that if they're not being filled with the spirit, what they do is they feel sorry for people. And you can end up ruining your life through immorality because you're feeling sorry for somebody. Amen. That's how that works. That's how that works. And so as we get into this, the first thing he says is we got to get a true statement here. Don't ever to your future thinking nobody knows the trouble you've seen. No, whatever you're going through, it's common not only to men, it's common to women and boys and girls. It is common to human beings. OK, we got that. So then we get into this. OK, so wait a minute, Ron. Temptation. This is what makes this verse so hard. The word temptation can be translated temptation, trial or testing. And so the context will determine what it means. But sometimes a trial or a test is basically to see what we have on the inside. See what you would do in a situation. See if you and I can be trusted. Can we be trusted? And so you have those things going on. When Abraham was tested with his son to show your faith out on the outside, to forget about talking about it, but start walking it. When we get tested, what really is in us comes out. You've heard that old illustration. You squeeze people and what's really on the inside comes out. We can talk all this Jesus and we can talk all this stuff. But you know what? It isn't going to really be shown where we really are until something comes and Jesus has to show up or I have to show up and, I, and Jesus, I don't let him show up. That's what I really believe. Are you following what I'm saying? So tests show us where we're really at. Amen. We can talk about what we would do in a situation. You can talk about what, how you would come through. 
But you need to be in the situation and then that'll show you what you really would do. Amen. Amen. You would love everybody, right? Well, that's why when you get in the car, somebody cuts you off to see how much you would really love somebody. Hello, are you, are you following me? That's why, you know, you said you would love somebody. That's why somebody that doesn't know you gets to call you a certain name to see how much you really love them. Amen? You know, you say you would really, you know, people, you, you would respond in love. You would love your enemies. That's like yesterday, me and my daughter were in a restaurant and we sat down and had some food and it was very evident the people around us did not want us in that restaurant. That's when you show some real Christian love. Are you going to do like kind? You see, you have to be tested to really know where you really are. Oh, yeah. Everybody's spiritual at home having their quiet time. Everybody's spiritual on the, the retreat up in the mountains and the next to the water and reading their Bible. Everybody's spiritual when they're home alone and they got everything the way they want it. No, it's in this dirty, nasty. People are getting on your nerves thing of life. That's where you see where your Christianity really is. See, a lot of us are legends in our own mind because we take our Christianity as a summary sentence of who we are when we're having our quiet time. No, uh -uh. it's when somebody's in your face. It's that bad job. It's that person in your family you don't get along with. It's that person in your church you don't like. That's where you see where your real Christianity is. And folks, please grab this. Chronological age has nothing to do with spiritual maturity. Huh? 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 Some of us is too old to be doing this naughty, nasty, dirty stuff we're doing. Nah. Amen. Uh, amen again. Amen. And so we're back to our text. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. Quit taking yourself so seriously. Quit being a legend in your own mind. These things happen to everyone. They happen to everyone. The word temptation, a temptation to do evil. Um, it means a trial or a testing. And as I said, sometimes you are going through a test. And if you're not careful, it becomes a temptation. You lost your job. You don't have any money. A lady leaves her purse there. Nobody's there but you. Your test of not having any money at that moment can become a temptation. Do I steal the lady's purse? I know she got money. It is then a temptation. Or do I grab her purse and go return it and find her and take nothing out of it? Do you see? It could be a test. Will I trust God? Or will I take things into my own hands and do it my way? And then here's the kicker. And then after we do it, justify it. It happened because she shouldn't have left her purse there. And blame, blame somebody. Hello? Are we following the text here? You getting something out of the text today? Okay, so as we go on, remember our word, our word there is temptation, trial, or testing. And sometimes it'll shift depending on what we're going through, okay? So we continue on here. and We're looking at part B of this verse. And the next thing we're going to have a truth is a truth about God. So the next thing is... God is faithful. God is faithful. Um, that's that's in your Bibles at least four times in the New Testament. It's here. He told them in chapter one, verse nine, God is faithful. He goes into another letter. He writes in Second Corinthians one eighteen. That's um, God is faithful. And then possibly the first book that Paul ever wrote. First Thessalonians chapter five, verse twenty four. He says God is faithful there. Paul was convinced. God is faithful. You have to ask yourself today, is God really faithful in your mind? Not your neighbors, not the church house, not the preacher. Is God really faithful to you? And that gets deep. Don't, don't give the right answer. Don't give the Christian answer. Give the answer that you are living out in your life. Is he faithful? Is God dependable? Have I found God to be reliable? That's what we're talking about, okay? that he's worthy of me to rely on him. That's what we're talking about. Paul says, okay, I'm schooling you guys for the future. Don't forget, that's what he's doing. Hey, nothing new under the sun when it comes into your life. And when it does come into your life, remember this, God is faithful. Those are the truth. Excuse me, that is the truth. Those are the facts. God 
is faithful. Break that down a little bit more. God's going to always be there for you. He's going to always be there for you. God in his essence and his character, they don't change. God is not going to be for you one day and not for you the next. His essence and his character doesn't change. God loves you deeply, more than you could ever imagine. More than you could ever imagine. God loves you deeply. And God desires the deepest intimacy with you that is possible. You, not somebody else. Amen. You're going through something. God hasn't moved. He still loves you. He hasn't changed. He still loves you. You're being tempted. He still loves you. He still wants intimacy with you. But we have to always remember. God is. About his glory and what he wants for you more than anything else is Christ likeness. Christ likeness. That's what God wants for you. And that's what he's doing. And that's what he's working on. No matter what you're going through, he's looking at Christ likeness. Amen. I got a confession to make. I was uh, working. We were, we've got about two couples that we have in premarital counseling right now. And uh, I say we because me and Carolyn are doing this together. And We've been sharing things with our couples and, and getting some basics in there. And as we do that, we, we come to a point where, you know, we're looking to say, hey, you know, we got to deal with this, deal with that. And so we're talking about laying your life on the altar, you know, coming to a place where, hey, God, I give you permission to do with me whatever you want to do with me. You know, and you've heard it so many times, you don't hear it anymore, right? But this week when I was doing that, I was explaining that and my wife was, Listening, and then afterwards, as we were driving home, she said to me, you know, Ron, you want to keep in mind, too, that the reason God wants you to lay your life on the altar is because he's really saying, I want you to give me permission to do whatever I would like to do so that you will be conformed to the image of Christ. Did anybody else get anything out of that besides me? See, Ron is like, you, give, you lay your life on the altar, where he wants you to go, what he wants you to do, you know, who he wants you to marry. It's about doing. And she reminded me, yeah, doing comes into play. But remember, God is about conforming us to the image of Christ. That's what it's about. That puts a whole new twist on that to a certain extent, conforming us to the image of Christ. Saints, whether you're going through a trial, a test, whatever you're going through, sometimes you're wondering, where's God at? Sometimes you're saying, why God? Where are you? Why me? What about him? What about her? You know, we do just like Peter did, right? I don't see them going through nothing. Why I have to have all this drama in my life? Why me? No matter what, folks, good, bad, different, whatever it is, God is about conforming you to the image of Christ. He wants you to be just like his son. And that's what it's about. And sometimes God is not going to give you every little thing you want because that's not getting you over there where you're conformed to the image of his son. Sometimes God has to say no to you. Sometimes God has to say maybe later to you. Sometimes he says yes, but he's got on glasses. Will this or will this not conform this person to the image of Christ? That's what it's about. You know? We're not saying you can't be happy. We're not saying you can't have joy. We're not saying you can't have emotion. But don't forget what's most important. God is about those things, but he's about conforming you to the image of Christ. And you know, you don't want to admit it, but I will. Some of us are stubborn and hard-headed. No amens. Amen, Lord. And sometimes that stuff hurts. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes that hurts because that's the only way we're going to get it is pain. You know, and so God is faithful. He's always there. His character doesn't change. He wants intimacy with you. He loves you. And he's looking at Christ likeness. Don't ever forget that when you're asking the questions. When you're asking the questions. Amen. So we're wrapping it up now. We're still in this one verse. So we have what we call 13 C today, and it's God's actions and his involvement. OK, so. 
He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but will with the temptation provide the way of escape so that you will be able to to endure it. God doesn't leave you. God's not going to forsake you. He's a very present help in trouble, what you're going through. And here's what God does. In your situation, God brings his will to build on something. He brings his will into this. He's going to make something happen. And what does he do? God says, I have a limit that I impose on what's going on in your life. I have a limit. Okay? It's not going to be something that tempts you so much you can't go there. It's not going to be a trial that's so bad that you have to go do something uh, as a permanent solution that's the wrong solution. It's nothing like that. God says, I have a limit on these things. It's not like I'm out of control. I am still sovereign. There is a limit to what's going on in your life. I limit it. And I do not allow anything to come into your life that's going to take you, so, as we would like to say, over the edge. He puts a limit on it. So you're not going to be tempted above what you can handle. You're not going to go through a trial and be tested above what you can handle either. God is faithful. He is right there with you and I as we go through these things. OK, he's right there. And he says that when you're going through this, there will be a way to escape. There will be a way out of it. OK, there will be a way out of it. God is very present in, in, in trouble and he moves in such a way that you can endure or bear up under this. OK, you can endure or bear up under this, whatever it is. The way out is the ability to bear it. OK, now this is where it gets kind of hairy because, well, wait a minute. If you got me under escape, why are you talking about doing an endure? If you said escape is there, why are you talking about bear it? Well, you got to read the rest of your Bible. You know what? God talks specifically about specific things when it comes to some of these things. Same letter here, same group of people over in chapter six, verse 18. You know what he said? When you are tempted by immorality. You know what he said? Flee, run. Don't talk, Don't try to have a Bible study. Don't pray about it. Don't rationalize it. Don't ask what is the culture saying? What does the mayor say? What does the governor say? If it's immorality, you run. Then you have the Old Testament. Run if you got to leave your jacket. Run anyway. Joseph. Amen. So see, you got to understand there are different situations here. We're going to go forward. The next verse says, and if some idolatry comes up, talking about being tempted to worship another God or putting somebody else or loving something more than God, run from that too. run from that. Don't pray about it. Don't have a Bible study. Run from it. Amen. But listen to what first Corinthians 10, 13 is saying without saying. Sometimes you get caught in a situation and you can't run, you can't move, you can't do anything. You just know God is there with you and he's going to give you the grace to stand there and come out of that A-OK. You can't always get out of the temptation. You can't always get out of the test. You can't always get out of the trial. But God is there with you and when you're done, you trust him, you're still going to be standing when it's all over. He's going to allow you to be able to bear up under it. Are you saying that? That's what the text is saying. So we close up just glancing at the context of the next verse, 14. It says, therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I've touched on that already. God's with us. He sets limits on what happens to us. Don't forget that. He enables us to endure. If there is an opportunity to flee, then we run, okay? Um, we do what we need to do. And so, as we close it up, what is he saying there? God's got you. God's got you. And he's telling these people, don't forget, they're over, he's thinking, don't be overconfident. Don't think you would never do that. Don't, 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 don't go there. Stay alert. I've just schooled you. You know, things happen to everybody. Um, God's there with you. He's going to take care of you. Remember that. And so he says, so if something comes up, some kind of idolatry, you flee from that. Don't do what Israel did and embrace it. Don't do that. Flee from it, however it comes up. And so he's telling them, I've given you a foolproof plan here for dealing with these particular things. 
So we close now with some life application and just a little summary. Very easy, very short. Um, this might have blew your mind a little bit. As you leave church today, would you remember you can be disqualified from Christian service? You can be disqualified, OK? Um, we need to, to grab that. It does not mean you're not saved. Nobody said anything about you being saved, but we can di be disqualified, and it's really disqualifying ourselves, in a sense, from Christian service. Have you ever thought about that? Do you take your Christian service for granted? Do you even think about that you can be replaced? That God can come up with someone else? Hello? It's kind of quiet. I mean, we don't think about those things. We think we're irreplaceable, invincible, untouchable. You know, that's only in the Batman movies. Amen? We're talking about Yahweh here. You know, do, do we think we're doing God a favor by serving him? You know, uh, I'm doing him a favor. You know, I'm doing him a favor. Uh, we probably need to look at that. Israel thought they were doing him a favor, too. You see, that's what Paul's saying. And then remember our temptations, our trials, our testings are common to everyone. Let's quit singing that song, okay? Somebody else is going through the same stuff or worse than you and I. Remember, God's faithful. He does set limits, okay? And he'll provide what we need to come out of our temptation, our trial, or our testing, glorifying him. It's all about glorifying God, and it's about being conformed to the image of God. If we remember those two things, that sets our attitude a lot better. You know, it ain't about me. It ain't about you. It's about God's glory and you and I finishing this thing out every day looking like Jesus. That's what God is doing. Amen? Let's close in prayer. Father, we want to thank you for the moments to go back in time and look at Israel and go back in time and look at the churches at Corinth, and to be reminded, Father, about Christian service and what a privilege it is, and to be reminded about disqualification. And so, Father, we want to thank you today that uh, you have reminded us that um, the things that come into our lives are common. And Father, help us to have that right perspective where we're not the martyr and uh, we're not the only one and nobody knows, and we, we get into these pity parties that are focused on me, myself, and I, instead of focusing on you. So thank you for the reminder today, Lord. Help us to remember what this thing is really all about. We thank you today. We praise you. We worship you that you're, you're a God who's faithful. You're someone who can be trusted. You're someone that we can rely on. And so we thank you so much for the truth of that. And let us take that as your word and live by faith and act like what you just said is true. And Lord, help us to hold on. Oh. Lord, you're not going to allow us to be tempted or tried or tested beyond what we're able. And we thank you. And you provide a escape hatch as well when it's needed. And Lord, if there is no escape hatch, you provide yourself that we're able to endure and still come out the way you want us to come out. So we win either way. So Father, as we transition out of the verse, grant us also to not play. Help us to flee idolatry. Flee these things, Lord, and not play with them and get ourselves in some messes that we really shouldn't even be in. So thank you again for your word, and we pray, Father, that um, the most important thing that we have grasped is that this is about your glory, and I pray that we will be a people that are more concerned about your glory than ours, and Father, that we will also be a people, Lord, who understand that the glasses that you're wearing are the glasses that conform us to the image of Christ. That's the most important thing on your agenda, and so, Father, help us to grasp that and hold on to that when we don't understand and we, 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 we feel like we've lost our way, that you're, you're there, you haven't moved, you love us, you haven't changed, but, Lord, you have a bigger plan, and eternity is far longer than if we were to get 100 years here. That's what you're working and planning on is eternity. And, Lord, thank you for what you were wanting to do there, but, Lord, you're wanting us to experience an abundant Christian life here, a victorious life, an overcoming life now, and it comes through being conformed to the image of your son. So thank you. May we cooperate with you and not fight against you, Lord. But thank you, regardless, you're faithful. In Christ's name we pray.